Hello, my name is Chris Kurzik and I'm the Principal Engineer at Athabasca Engineering Solutions, AES for short. And uh, what does AES do? Well, first of all, we provide third-party value evaluations. We provide training and certification. We provide equipment re-rating. Folks, we are going to start a new series called Part 6, Pinning Corrosion. It's under API 579, and this is episode one. And so what we're gonna look at is some of the general notes in the preamble for the section, so we can do some buildup of our understanding. We're gonna look at the, the types of pinning corrosion, followed by applications and some limitations that we should be aware of, and the inspection requirements associated with pitting corrosion. One, the general notes. We have a couple of fundamental definition. What is pitting? Pitting is defined as localized regions of metal loss. And we have an image to our right of a typical pitting situation. And the pit diameter must be less than or equal to the plate thickness, which makes sense. Applicable uh, to the following types. So they talk about widely scattered pitting, you know, that is significant in the region of, of a component where the part might be, for example, weakened, such as a pressure envelope and local thinned area the region of widely scattered pitting is is uh, also uh, one of the applicabilities and the lta we're going to use that term a lot so bear that abbreviation in mind and we're also looking at localized regions of pitting where pitting is concentrated and finally pitting confined to the locally thinned area Got a couple of, of methods to re-rate parts. For example, pressure vessels and piping, we need to determine the maximum allowable working pressure for the re-rate. And for tank courses, we determine the maximum fill height, uh, MFHR. So those are the approaches. There are limitations and applicability. We'll continue that. So part six is limited to pitting corrosion only. So if you have multiple mechanisms, which is pretty much every case, then you need to go and look at part two, table 2.1 to sort of develop a strategy. And uh, we've had several examples where we go back to table 2.1 and uh, we, we try to systematically develop a, a process of analysis. The second one is part six is, six is not applicable to uh, you know items in the in the creep range temperature. In this case, you'd have to go to part four. Table four point one is recommended. Look at level one and two assessments. They're applicable only if the the original design was designed to recognize code and standards and in 579 there's a list of the codes but i mean it's pretty comprehensive like you've got the pressure vessel code section 8 division 1 b 313 and but if you're doing anything outside of the, that listing then you, the uh, you can't use level one and two and this is very similar to what's required for the other types of assessments and the materials must have sufficient toughness. So then you have to go back in and take a look at the ductile uh, transition properties. And if you go into a part three assessment, uh, you can have a look at that. We've done extensive videos over the last few years and, and there's stuff on uh, MDMT and so on. And um, it can be very sensitive to the thickness of a part. And also uh, level one and two can't be done if um, You've got uh, cyclic service issues. A few more thoughts for us. Level one and two applicable if 
and this is the case for level one. So that's a type one component. So that would be a shell component. We have a, a, a video that I encourage you to have a look at where we, we go and we break down what type A, B, in the different types of classes of components. This is a very common throughout all of the different assessments in API 579. Now for level two, this could be a level, a type A or a B component. Other level one requirements to be aware of. So the pitting damage is arrested. That means it's not continuing to grow. And the, the, the pitting is on the ID or the OD of the, of the surface. And um, the third condition is if there's a lot of pit fits present, then if you have individual pits, then they encourage you to go to part five. Look at some additional level two requirements. First of all is th there's th discussion about pitting damage. And what they say is local thinned area, LTA, is a region of widely scatterized pitting. And it applies to localized regions of pitting. And it applies to pitting confined to the LTA. Another point is pitting can, uh, can be on one or both surfaces, but they can't overlap. And there's some interesting, if that's the case, we have overlapping, then one should go, it's recommended to go to part five. The other one is if there are many, many pits and individual pits or isolated pairs, then they're saying go to part five, which is the localized, um, you know, the, the, um, the localized thinning section. Here's some more thoughts. Pitting, if a pitting comparison chart is not available, then you should be doing level two. If there's widespread pitting throughout the part, then again, consider a level two assessment. In six to six, level two and three evaluation should be performed at a specific future inspection date with available data. It goes on to say that the future corrosion allowance, FCA, is should not be applied to the pit depth and the diameter. Going into 6.3 about inspection requirements. So the, the inspections are based upon pit charts. And, and so you need to get the, the gather the data for the FFS assessment. And so for a level one assessment, we, we determine the surface damage and compare it to standard pit charts. And you can see those pit, pit, pit charts in figures 6.3 to 6.10. And so in order to classify the levels of, of uh, pitting. And the photograph, so what they need to do is they need to photograph the pitting with to scale and use this chart to do a comparison. And UT scan is, is another process that can really um, assist with this. It becomes increasingly difficult to do because there's a lot of inter more interpretation required and more experience as a result. So some things to think about, random size and pit distribution. There may be judgment required to estimate the pit population. And if pitting is uniform, then you need to take the minimum sample size of at least 10 pit couples they're recommending. And if pitting is non-uniform, then additional data is required to do a more in-depth analysis about how to do pitting inspections. So basically there's a chart here. We, we basically number all the pits and we get the orientation and then we, we calculate a few things. So for level two assessments, uh, we're looking at the pit couplings 
are are to to be independent of each other. So example in the middle there is pit one and pit two, and so you can see pit one and two, and they, you can characterize the distance and the angle that they are apart. Step two one is you know if you have to select over greater than 10 pits, you have to have a reasonably sized population of st samples because this is a statistical analysis. Uh, we are selecting a pair of neighboring pits and create 10 pits with no repetition is permitted. So you can't use them twice. And then you go to do 6.4 to do the assessment. Biaxial stress, then take a look at figure 611 and basically uh, if you have a plate that's subject to that one then your stress field should be interpreted um, so when you take your stress your primary stress on your on your region you want to use uh, make sure that the, the, the stress one is greater than stress two and then put that into your chart so you can do your evaluation 611 that describes some of the parameters that must go into a report and the dimensions are shown here so for example we're looking at the the distance between the pits and usually it's taken at approximately the deepest point approximately and then uh, the you know the the diameter of the pit and then the, the height and then you basically determine the average, which is, you know, the top minus the bottom sort of situation. And that's how we would determine that. So, yeah, that's the parameters for analysis. Of alluded to earlier, it's really important to get the stress field correct. So, so stress one, primary stress one is greater than two and that you oriented the pit coupling dimensions to suit the fields. Another thought is, you know, a sensitivity analysis is, is uh, a, a not very important to determine, um, you know, whether more data needs to be acquired. Reassessment, basically you, you go build from level two and you follow all those requirements. And then you have to use the actual yield strength and the stress strain uh, information is required for the curve. In the, in section two, there is some uh, of ASME or the pressure vessel code. There's some information available about the stress strain if you're looking for those kind of numbers. Another thing to as we close up the inspection requirements is this concept of the pitting progression rate. It's actually very difficult to estimate. Uh, it do, due to the prediction of the pit size increase and the pit density, and it requires a lot of experience to do so. And the estimates, you know, is based on experience and, and also like a really understanding, you know, the, the, the operation that you're in and understanding the operating history. I hope that you found this presentation useful and valuable to you. This was provided by Athabasca Engineering Solutions. We'd love to hear your feedback and, and your thoughts on further videos. And we'd love to hear from you. Maybe we can do some business. Please subscribe to our channel so you don't miss a thing. Take care for now.